Amazon workers down in Bessemer, Alabama, they're still waiting for results from that union vote that took place. Employees voted to determine whether the nearly 6,000 employees there will join the retail, wholesale, and department store union. So regardless of the outcome, vote marks a new movement towards unionization, not only for Amazon workers, but tech laborers. Senior reporter at ProPublica, author of Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America, Alec McGillis, he's here to discuss the union votes, the significance of that, and more. Alec, I know we don't have the details of this. Um, it's great to see you again. I'm curious, and I saw a take of yours recently, which I thought really want you to expand on, which is that uh, comparing Amazon and its future of unionization and what that would mean for a burgeoning middle class in America. Just go into that a little bit. Sure. Uh, these warehouses have grown so much uh, in the last year. There were already there were already so many of them, and now we've added like 400,000 more Amazon workers, 50% more warehouse space around the country just this past year. So increasingly, uh, this warehouse work, this fulfillment work, is becoming really sort of the the new kind of mass option for the the sort of entry level low. You know, sort of low skilled job for the working mm -hmm. class in this country. And and if this is the reality for now for, for, for hundreds of thousands of American workers, if you want to, to lift up that kind of work, it's really going to mean uh, focusing on these warehouses and, 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 and organizing them and, and kind of getting them back, getting them to the point where where other forms of sort of entry level work were in, in decades past. Manufacturing became a sort of middle class, stable, sustainable family job for a lot of families because of because those jobs were lifted up through organizing in the last century. And the, and the big question now is whether we can sort of do the same for this kind of warehouse work and, and lift it up to something that can actually to support a family and not just be a low paid job that someone kind of, you know, comes through for a year and then leaves. Yeah. I think that's a really important point because we have this sort of like halcyon glow around manufacturing jobs because they were largely unionized, because they were able to support a sort of like middle class, stable lifestyle with uh, job security and health benefits. But it wasn't always that way. So you can have good jobs today. It's just right now, in particular, because the rate of unionization is so incredibly low, that's become an impossibility. Talk about some of the follow-on effects for even non-union workers if you had something like Amazon that's such a behemoth within the labor market if you had their workers largely organized. It would just, it would just sort of lift things up kind of across the board. If, I mean, you make such an important point about the, the those industrial jobs. We have to be careful about not idealizing them. They were, they were incredibly... Um, treacherous and in the early 20th century, incredibly low paid without any say um, on the job and just incredibly demanding hours, incredibly demanding productivity expectations. And, and in a way, we've now kind of come full circle um, uh, and, and we're back to, you know, these, the, these jobs that have replaced them, these warehouse jobs being, being very um, being low paid, incredibly high demands, no say on the job. And, and so in a way, we're on this sort of historical arc. And if we could then, if we could um, sort of lift these kind of jobs up through through organizing, um, it would just make an extraordinary, extraordinary difference because they have become such a big part of the labor market. I mean, they just have, it's hard to, for, I think, for us to grasp just how much, Amazon's now the second largest employer in the country after after Walmart, and, and there's just, and, and the growth shows no sign of stopping because we have just so shifted our habits over to, to e-commerce. That's something I want to really underscore for people. I did not comprehend until I talked to you and read your book just how much the pandemic alone actually changed Amer the entire face of America to the benefit of Amazon. And so if Amazon is going to be the second largest employer in the United States, if they're going to add, what, say 400,000 new jobs, I mean, it, it will essentially replace like grocery store worker, et cetera, or movie theater, or whatever, as the entry level yeah. position for anybody who does not go to college in the United States. That gives them extraordinary power in our labor market. And yet, Alex, something you've commented on is how this company has been a masterclass, at least, you know, almost envious, honestly, of the way they have handled their PR machine and lobbying machine here in Washington. That's right. And but your point about them replacing the, the, those other workers is so key. And it, one way to think about this is that we've essentially replaced retail, brick and mortar retail workers, retail clerks, salespeople with, with Amazon warehouse workers. But the Amazon warehouse work is much more 
physically taxing, much more isolating than than the retail work was. Um, so it's really more like factory work in a way, except it's not paid as well as the factory work was. So it's in this it's, it's in this kind of gray area where it's both much physically harder and much just tougher work than your average retail job, but it's also not paid as much as the manufacturing jobs that it more resembles. Um, so that's that, that's really where we are. And yes, and Amazon has just been until now. Um, incredibly adept at basically somewhat sort of shielding that reality and saying, look, $15 an hour, that's double the minimum wage. That's better than nothing, right? And, they've, and until this point, that, argu that argument has basically been enough to kind of assuage the average consumer. Yeah, they mm -hmm. want to be seen more like the low-wage retail work right. versus the, they don't want to be compared to what people used to make in manufacturing uh, or on, you know, the uh, at the auto, uh, in the auto industry. Right. Um, Alec, I wanted to get your take. We talked about this a little bit already, but I wanted to get your take on Bezos coming out and saying, love the infrastructure package, totally cool with the corporate tax hike. What did you think of that? <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I think for one thing, it just shows that, that the, the notion that he's going to sort of slip away into the into into the into the gloaming is you know was was overstated you know he's definitely still going to have a big voice in um if, uh, on on the company's behalf um the, the the company's been paying playing a very interesting game with taxes for years now you know that that um it, it, it sort of avoided sales taxes, assessing sales taxes for for decades. That's sort of how it got as big as it was. But then, as soon as it um, it made sense for it, sort of economically and politically, vis-a-vis -vis its rivals, to to start accepting sales tax, um, it became sort of pro sales tax for e-commerce. Um, it's been very successful at avoiding federal income taxes. It paid zero federal income taxes just a couple years ago, um, and actually, in so in a way, you know, it because it's so much. Better at avoiding federal income taxes than say Walmart. Raising the rate uh, matters less to it. Walmart pays. Uh, Walmart has you know has all sorts of problems. What it's done to this country, but it pays far more federal income taxes than does the, than does Amazon. So one, one can be pretty confident that that comment like that is is not sheer you know political altru altruism. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to me, Alec. Both on terms of, you know, if they're so, given how they responded to the union drive versus how they're now supporting the corporate tax mm. rate, I am willing to bet what I see, one, as an existential threat and other. But am, is my question flawed there? Amazon has tried to portray unionization as an existential threat to its ability to generate profits and in order to operate its business. Is there actually any evidence to that effect? Uh, no, I mean, yeah. if, if you had, if if the if the company were 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 organized, it would have to pay its workers somewhat more, and you know, there's some 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 of those billions would 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 stay with with the workers rather than sort of um, f floating to the to the top in the form of these incredible uh, you know shareholder gains and and, and 58 billion dollars in personal wealth for Bezos gained over this past year and and it would yes it would it would change the way that warehouses run to some extent there would be probably somewhat um, somewhat more you know workers say in in just in in the various these incredibly high demands on on the warehouse floor and and how the robots are being brought in and all that somewhat more break time for workers but um, but the notion that I mean we, we've had all sorts of different industries and sectors that that have over you know over the last century that have been been organized and were, and they've managed to make it work that this in fact the warehouses are exactly the kind of workplace that has actually is seems so suitable to organizing in the sense that it's a traditional workplace with with you know hundreds of workers in one place we're not talking about you know gig work like uber where it's actually kind of tricky to see how how the organizing would actually play out in reality with warehouses it's not that hard to imagine yeah, mm -hmm. very well said. Alec, great to have your insights on this. Thank you. Thanks, Alec. Right. Thank you. Thanks. More Rising for you after this.